and the kingdom of darkness with light, and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ, to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Today we have the privilege of hearing the greatest sermon ever preached. Of course, this sermon is not by men, nor is the content from men. We're talking about today the great Sermon on the Mount delivered by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Matthew 5 through 7. We hope that you'll get your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to think about this powerful message together. The Sermon on the Mount has been heralded as one of the greatest teachings of how to live for Christ ever delivered, naturally given by the Master Teacher Himself, Jesus Christ. This sermon is all about the qualities, the characteristics, and the lifestyle that a follower of Christ ought to have. And really, it takes a person from the beginning of faith to a faith that is ready to stand the test of time and ultimately give its life for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so today, we're going to be thinking about the words of Jesus as delivered in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. We begin by noting the characteristics of someone who's going to be a part of Christ's kingdom. I believe these have been aptly described as kingdom characteristics. What's the character of someone who's going to be in the kingdom of Christ like? The Beatitudes of Matthew 5 verses 1 through 12 beautifully describe that character. You have, first of all, the beginning of faith. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, listen to these beautiful words. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse number 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. You've got, you've got those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, and those who are meek. You know, if I'm going to come to Christ... I've got to realize spiritually my own poverty. When we talk about blessed are the poor in spirit, we're talking about realizing without Christ our own spiritual lack of ability to save ourselves, our own, our own inability to really do anything spiritually. Being poor in spirit means I realize I am dependent upon Christ for my needs spiritually. Blessed are those who mourn. Once I realize my own spiritual poverty, then I've got to be willing to mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Are we talking about that Christians go around with a gloomy look and that we're sad all the time? No, that's not the idea. But we're sorrowful for sin. We mourn, we lament, and we weep over sin. And it brings us to a point where we're ready to change our lives. Then once we've realized our own spiritual poverty, once we're ready to, to mourn over and repent and change our lives about sin, blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. The idea of inheriting the earth, found all the way back to the Psalms, is to inherit the blessings of God given to His people is the idea. And friend, to do that, I've got to be meek. I've got to be humble. I've got to be submissive. And I've got to be willing to submit my life unto God's hands so that He can truly make me what He wants me to be. Then as that faith begins, we see faith grow. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6, Jesus says these words, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Once I come to my senses and realize I need God, I, I need to rid my life of sin. I need to be humble and submit to His will. I've got to make it a name to learn more about God and grow in Him. Blessed, listen to these words. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. There's that insatiable desire to grow spiritually and to be what God wants me to be. As a Christian, you never stop growing. Paul would say, or Peter would say, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But then that faith that has started and that faith that is growing is ultimately going to be perfected in the Beatitudes as well. Listen to Matthew 5, 
beginning in verse number 7. The scripture says, Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We've got, we've got now changing our character to mercy, to peacemakers, to, to being sons of God, to being the type of people who want to do good in others, who love God and, and love others as the Scripture teaches. People whose lives are filled with mercy, who want to bring the peace of God to others, and that, that faith is now being perfected through the trials and the, and the and things that Christians go through every day. And then, of course, once that faith has started, begins to grow and is being perfected, you can be sure that faith is also going to be tried. Listen to Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Every child of God who's trying to grow, who's trying to submit to God's will, who's trying to really make his life what God wants it to be, is at times going to face persecution. How do we look at that? Blessed are those who are persecuted. Hey, they did it to the prophets before you. It's going to happen. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so when we, when we realize, hey, this persecution is happening, what's going on? Remember, God said it was going to happen. Remember that we are working toward and being prepared and perfected to handle that and with God's help. Listen to Philippians 4.13. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so as the child of God, we have everything we need to be what God wants us to be. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, about verses 13 through 16, we're now going to see the Christian's example. We've seen the Christian characteristic, what we're to have, the traits I'm to have in the kingdom. Now, we also want to emphasize the example that the Christian is going to be to those in the world. Listen to Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. As we think about the Christian example, two really vivid illustrations are used, and, and you can see these in your life as I can in mine. When's the last time you ate something that was really, really bland? I'm talking about didn't have any seasoning, didn't taste very good, tasted flat and bland, and you thought, you know, where's the salt? That would be probably one of your first thoughts. Well, when we cook, we want to put salt in it. It, bring, it enhances the flavor. It brings it out. It's a preservative. Everything needs a little bit of salt. And thus, Christians are the salt of the world. They bring, they enhance it. They bring flavor. They ought, it ought to be attractive. It ought to make want, people want to see what Christianity is all about. And then a, a second rather vivid illustration. You... Jesus says, are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill, Jesus says, can be seen by everybody. No, you, you imagine this illustration. Now you think about the irony of this. Nobody lights a lamp and puts a basket on top. What good would it do to turn on a flashlight and put a cup over the top of it? Well, that'd be crazy. Nobody would do that. You're the light of the world. Jesus' point is, let your light shine. Don't put it out. Don't, don't, don't put anything over top of it. Be encouraged to be a Christian and shine your light for Jesus Christ. And thus, this is why he'll say in that memorable verse, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so we see, first of all, the Christian's traits, his qualities, his characteristics. We then see the, the Christian example. 
And now we direct our attention to Matthew chapter 5, the conclusion of that chapter, verses 17 through 48, where we see the Christian's righteousness. And friend, the Bible identifies that that righteousness ought to be exemplified in our life. We want, we want to show an example of how to live the right life. And of course, he'll mention the following things. We've got Christians' righteousness and anger. We're no longer going to have the idea of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Rather, we love our enemies. We do good to those who are in need. We've got righteousness and, and, and self-control. You know, you've heard of old that it was said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus says, But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman, in essence, has already committed adultery with her. And so we've got the ideas of, of controlling ourselves. Control your anger. Control your desires. Jesus will say. We've got teachings about the Christian's righteousness and divorce. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 31 through 32. Furthermore, it has been said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality, fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Christians are to maintain a, a godly marriage. God intended, according to Genesis 2.24, for this reason, man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. God intended for one man and one woman to be married for life. That's God's original plan, and Christian marriages ought to exemplify that. Jesus identifies our righteousness as it relates to our speech and to making oaths that people can't keep. You know, they, Jews are great about making these promises. They would swear by the temple. They'd swear by the number of hairs on their head. And Jesus said, in essence, cut out the swearing and just let your yes be yes and your no be no. We're not living under the age of retaliation. I'm not going to go looking to knock somebody's tooth out if they knock mine out or punch somebody in the eye or eye for an eye. No, that's not the way we live. Love your enemies, Jesus will say. Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. Do good to them. Pray for them. Those who curse you and spitefully use you, Jesus will say, love your enemies. Be perfect, complete as your Father in heaven is also complete. And so the Christian's righteousness is identified and contrasted with many of the commands of the Old Covenant and even brought to a higher plane, a newer and greater level in Christianity. Now in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is going to identify the Christian's sincerity and to show how we're to be sincere in what we believe and what we teach. We have sincerity in our giving. In Matthew chapter 6, you've got you know, the idea of these people doing their charitable deeds, and they want to do their charitable deeds to be seen by men. And Jesus said, we're not going to do charitable deeds to be seen by others. We give to God, and God knows the good that we've done. You've got uh, sincerity in praying. You know, the Jesus contrast, the Christian's prayer life, with that of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. He said, you know, the religious leaders, they want to stand on the street corner. They want to pray the long prayers to be heard by men. Jesus said, you, when you pray, go into your inner closet, go into your inner room. There pray to God who sees in secret, and He will ultimately hear and bless us. It's not about, hey, look at me. This is the way the Jews were. Look at me. Look what I'm giving. Look how I'm praying. Matthew 6, verse 16 through 18. Look at the great fasting that we've done, how we're denying ourselves. Their religion was a lot about them. And Jesus over and over again in the New Testament will identify them. Hypocrites, he'll say. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying? Matthew 23, he will identify them in a very picturesque term. Jesus will say of the religious elite, your whitewashed walls, beautiful, ornate on the outside, whitewashed tombs, beautiful, ornate on the outside, inside, Jesus will say, you're full of dead men's bones. They look pretty. Everybody looked to, up to them and thought, wow, look at these guys giving. Look, look, at their, look at their praying. Look at their fasting. On the exterior, 
they look like the perfect picture of what people think religion is all about. What about on the inside? Rot, filth, and immorality and ungodliness is what Jesus identified. Their hypocrisy did not at all please God. And so, friend, when we give, when we pray, when we make dedication and commitment to God, God's not concerned about me letting everybody else see that. That's not at all what it's about. My sincerity and my commitment is between me and God. It may be the case that sometimes people see you pray. It may be the case that people see us giving. That's not what it's about, though. We're not doing our charitable deeds to be seen by men. We're doing those ultimately to please God and to make sure that we're giving and worshiping as God wants us to. Now, the rest of the chapter, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34, we see the Christian's priorities are here emphasized. We've got priorities and making sure where our treasure is. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where uh, rust and moth destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. There's priority number one. Where's your treasure at? What things are we really striving for in this life? What's our goal? What are we trying to achieve? Is heaven the ultimate priority of every Christian? We've got priorities in making sure that our vision is where it needs to be. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 22 and 23. Jesus mentions these words. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Here's the point. If the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Where's our vision? What, where's the source of light that's being brought into our life and into our body? Christ is the light of the world. John 8 verse 12. Are we letting Him light our path? Psalm 119, 105. Are we letting Him be the light and the vision that we have in this life. Then he mentions another priority, and it's our priority in devotion. What are we really devoted to in this life? Listen again to Matthew 6, 24. No one, Jesus says, can serve two masters. Why not? Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or earthly riches. Where's our devotion? What are we really devoted to? Is it the job? Is it our recreation? Is it our family? Nothing wrong with any of those things necessarily. But where's our real devotion? Is it mammon, worldly riches and treasures and things of this world that perish with the using? Or are we really devoted to God and to His cause? And then a fourth priority, and that is the Christian and not letting worry rule his life, trusting in God, seeking first the kingdom. Jesus in Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34, will talk about life. And he'll talk about you know, food and clothing and shelter. And he says, in essence, and, and this is the real impact of what Jesus is trying to say. He says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? What's this point all about? Friend, my life is not, you know, sometimes I think, our life is geared around food, is it not? Sometimes we think from meal to meal to meal. What we're going to wear today, what we're going to put on, what we're going to eat. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? That's Jesus' whole point. If we're focused on spiritual things, Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be provided unto you. If I put God's kingdom first, if the kingdom and God is my priority, Everything else is going to fall in line. Doesn't mean I won't have to work. Doesn't mean there might be times where I have to dig a little harder and work a little, you know, dig a little deeper. But friend, God's going to take care of His children and make sure that they are provided for. Now, as we turn our attention in this great sermon to Matthew chapter 7, we now look at the Christian and judgment. And friend, there, we do, Christians do have to make judgments. Every day that I wake up and every day that you wake up, I've got to make decisions. I've got to make moral decisions. I've got to make decisions about life every day. And the Christian is authorized to make decisions and to make judgments. Jesus said in John 7, 24, judge with a righteous judgment. Now, if there is one verse that a host of people, and especially those who don't like to be pointed out for moral uh, things that are morally against the Scripture, no. 
It's Matthew 7, 1. A lot of people quote it. Judge not that you be not judged. What kind of judgment is Jesus talking about? Wrong, hypocritical judgment. Listen to Matthew 7, verse 1, or verse number 2. Jesus says, For with what judgment you judge, you'll be judged. With what measure you see, use, it'll be measured back to you. Now here's the illustration. Why do you look at the speck or the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck or the splinter from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrites, first remove the plank from your own eye, then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus is not condemning all judging. You've got to stand behind the Word of God and stand up for what's right. And remember, John 7, 24, Jesus said, Judge how? With righteous judgment. Well, that's definitely not what's going on here. I mean, you think about the, our, the clarity of the illustration Jesus uses. Here's two people, okay? One of them has a splinter in his eye. The other one has a two-by-four coming out of his eye. The one with the two by four says to the man who's got the splinter, come over here. Let me get that little splinter out of your eye. When well, he's got this massive two by four coming out of the side of his head. Oh, what's that all about? These people, these hypocrites, are living in, in uh, contrary to the will of God. Their life is in complete disarray to the will of God. They want to nitpick at the little splinter in this person over here when their life is in complete contradiction to the will of God. Jesus is discussing hypocritical judging. God's going to make the right judgment according to His will. Christians are to stand behind that. We're commanded to judge with righteous judgment, which is judging according to the will of God. Now, friend, as you look in Matthew chapter 7, about verses 13 through 27, the Christian also has certain commitments that he is to stand behind and live up to. We have the commitment to right and wrong. There is a right way, Jesus says. The majority of the people in this world are not going down that path. It is the narrow, it is the difficult way that leads to eternal life, and few there are going down it. I have a commitment to strive to walk down the narrow path. I have a commitment to follow the true teaching and teachers of the gospel. There are many false sheep or many wolves out there who are trying to bring God's people astray. They're, she they're wolves in sheep's clothing, Jesus will, will say, and you'll know them by their fruits. We have a commitment to both saying and being what God wants us to be and a commitment to hearing and doing the will of God. And so I've got to stand behind the commitments that we see in Scripture. And so what do we learn in this masterful, wonderful lesson in Matthew 5 through 7? We learn what's required to be a child of God. I've got to be poor in spirit. I've got to realize, hey, without God, I don't have any. I'm spiritually bankrupt without God, without Christ in my life. I've got to realize the, the sorrow and the heartbreak that sin brings. The soul who sins shall surely die, Ezekiel 18, 4. I've got to have the, the humility, the meekness, and the submissiveness to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Acts chapter 9, verse number 6. I've got to be willing to grow every day as a child of God. I've got a hunger and thirst after righteousness, and I've got to strive to be what God wants me to be, to be merciful, to be kind, to be a peacemaker, to, to love other people, and to realize along the way, persecutions are going to come. God can help me through those, and others as well have faced them. Friend, we ask you today the greatest question of all. Have you become a member of the Lord's kingdom? Have you obeyed the voice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Where is your treasure? Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Are you seeking first God's kingdom? Are you on that narrow path that leads to eternal life? If not, we're urging you today, won't you become a child of God? Believe Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Having believed that, make a commitment to change your life and repent 
unless you repent, Peter said, you'll all likewise perish. Acts 3 verse 19, having repented, would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men? Acts chapter 8 verse 36 through 38, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And would you, as Jesus said in John 3 verse 5, be born of water and the Spirit, that you may enter the kingdom of God. If you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, we're begging you to do that today. There is no greater, safer place in all the world than the kingdom of Christ. If you're not in it, we beg you today, become a Christian, obey the gospel, get into the kingdom of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.